In this case study, we are concerned with English alabasters uh, made in the Middle Ages, particularly uh, beginning in uh, the 14th century and continuing well into the 15th century. By the 15th century, uh, the production of sculpted alabaster in England had almost become an industry. And altarpieces like the one that you see here in Haddon Hall in Derbyshire uh, were ma almost mass produced in the hundreds. And uh, they ended up in churches all over Europe. In Nottingham in England, a particularly fine grained type of gypsum alabaster could be uh, found and it was quarried out pretty much uh, in the 14th and 15th centuries and uh, used in fairly small blocks like the ones that you see making up this altarpiece and you can see a, a detail on the right um, and these were uh, carved and painted and shipped all over Europe uh, to France and to Spain in particular, also to the Netherlands, um, and were really one of the primary medieval uh, artistic exports at this time period. Uh, they oftentimes, these altarpieces had sort of stock iconography, so certain stories that would be told. And this particular one for example, shows uh, kind of the, the passion of Christ. So it begins with his entry tri triumphally on a donkey into Jerusalem, ends with his crucifixion, death, and resurrection. Um, and I'll show you those in the next slide. Here again in the Haddon Hall uh, altarpiece, I'm showing you two more of the alabaster plaques from that altarpiece. Um, and you can see on the left, Christ being removed from the cross. This is a subject matter commonly called the deposition from the cross. Um, and you can see that uh, members of his group of friends and followers are using pliers to remove the nails so that he can be lifted down very carefully from the cross. And then on the right, we have one of the, we have the very next scene in the sequence. Um, and this shows Christ being placed in the tomb. And you can see in both of these, the Virgin Mary is uh, one of the, the primary mourning figures, as is Joseph of Arimathea, whose grave uh, was donated to house the, the body of Christ. Um, in this scene of mourning, too, we can recognize Mary Magdalene. She's the one who is uh, kneeling at the base of the sarcophagus, and she's holding her long hair and using it to uh, wash Christ's wounds with her hair. This is a reference to an earlier episode in the Gospels. What I'd like you to notice is the, the fairly simple treatment of the figures. Uh, they're fairly uh, formulaically treated with um, pretty standardized faces and bodies. Um, and in fact, we know that uh, in the, by, by the time we get into the 15th century, uh, you would actually have certain artists who specialized in certain scenes. And so for an altarpiece like this, you might actually have uh, a group of different artists, uh, each one specializing in one or two particular scenes, all working together to kind of knock this out as quickly as possible. I also want you to notice the use of color. Um, in a way, we come full circle with alabaster and also with, um, with marble uh, in that we started this uh, course talking about pigments with ochre and lapis lazuli. And here we're going to end by talking about, uh, at least to some degree, sculptures that were painted. Um, and had color added to them. And we have a tendency to think of sculpture as not having been colored, but more and more, 
uh, the evidence is to the contrary. And we know definitely from the survival of a great deal of color on these alabaster pieces that uh, they were definitely painted. In addition to the life and death of Christ, alabaster pieces might also feature uh, the life of the Virgin and the sorrows of the Virgin. And so what we see here in a general view and a detail of one of these alabaster carvings is uh, the Virgin Mary uh, kneeling at a, uh, a reading desk um, engaged in uh, religious study and she is surprised by the entry of the angel Gabriel. This is a scene of the Annunciation. And so Gabriel is the, the sort of shortish figure to her left, um, and there's a scroll that kind of scrolls around a lily flower. So the lily is commonly associated with the Virgin Mary. It's called a Madonna lily. And the scroll is meant to represent the words that um, Gabriel will say to the Virgin Mary, which are, blessed are you among women, uh, for you will be the mother of God. Uh, and then we have an additional reference to Mary's coming pregnancy in the upper left here. And you can see this both in the general view and in the detail. Uh, we have God the Father up in heaven making a gesture of blessing. But also I want you to notice that there we have visible breath coming from his mouth. And that breath then takes on the form of the dove of the Holy Spirit, which is uh, there to show that Mary is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and actually become pregnant while still a virgin with the Christ child. Uh, oftentimes we see in um, Northern Renaissance art and sometimes also in Italian Renaissance art, the dove of the Holy Spirit sort of entering uh, the Virgin Mary's ear uh, on a, a shaft of light, um, or sometimes you see a little flying baby. Um, but there's always some way of kind of giving us some clue of uh, what is happening in the Annunciation. You should notice that uh, we have, a, a, again, a very brightly colored work, uh, although here it's clear that a lot more color has been lost. But you can see that Mary originally wore a very bright crimson gown. Um, it might have had an underpainting in red ochre, but seems like it probably also had a brighter, more expensive, possibly lead or mercury-based red used on top. Um, and then she has a dark blue overcloak, um, at least meant to... Uh, be lapis lazuli. Whether it was actually painted in lapis or not, I don't know. Uh, that would be something for pigment analysis. Um, and then you can see there's the use of uh, yellows, which are very likely uh, yellow ochre. There's also some evidence that gilding was also used in this piece. You can see uh, sort of the cloth behind Mary's halo appears to have some dots of gold on it, for example. Here are two particularly uh, nicely made alabasters, both in the Victoria and Albert Museum, and they appear stylistically and also from their color and uh, the way that they're painted to have come from the same altarpiece. And what we're seeing on the left is kind of a representation of the Holy Trinity. Um, originally, there would have been a dove of the Holy Spirit behind, between the hands of God the Father. And then you see that he's sort of balancing Christ on the cross uh, between his knees and also holding a, uh, a little bundle in his hands that shows uh, some of the blessed kind of being brought up into heaven. So the message here has to do with the salvation of humanity through the intervention of Christ and his willingness to be sacrificed on our behalf on the cross. Uh, and you can see those elongated angels uh, carrying uh, different instruments um, and holding up the cross. 
And this would have been very rich, richly painted. You can see uh, traces of some gold in the cloth behind uh, the, the halo of God the Father. Uh, you can also see some gold on his crown, which is quite elaborate. Um, but at the same time, I'd like you to notice how extremely stylized this is and how sort of formulaic uh, the figures of the angels are, uh, their poses, everything is strictly symmetrical. Um, and so this would have adhered to sort of a regular pattern that this particular sculptor would have done. On the right, we have uh, what is called a representation of the tree of Jesse. And this is kind of a simplified way of showing the family tree of Christ. Uh, so we have Jesse asleep, having a dream, and from him springs a vine, which is uh, a representation of Christ's ancestry. And right above Jesse in the center, you can see a, a crowned figure playing a harp. That's King David. And Christ is part of the house of David. So right up above David's head in this representation, we see the Virgin Mary with Christ on her lap. Um, and that's meant to, to give us sort of an abbreviated version of his lineage. And what makes uh, it clear that these two pieces probably came from the same altarpiece is if you look at the, the sort of flower decoration on the bases of both of them, we have sort of that dark blue and then flowers made out of red and white dots uh, that resemble each other, very similar tone of red, uh, a similar degree of uh, gilding, that is powdered gold that would have been painted on. Um, so again, these are the kind of things that were produced uh, really in incredible numbers. And I'm just going to show you a couple of other examples um, to, to sort of flesh out your picture of what these would look like. Here are a couple of uh, alabaster pieces from what would have been a much larger representation of the Last Judgment. So here what we're seeing are actually the sides of the Blessed and the Damned. Um, so on our left, but this would be Christ's right. Up above this, there would be a representation of uh, God the Father in heaven or Christ uh, in judgment. And so on uh, our left, Christ's right, we see St. Peter uh, with his keys welcoming three smiling naked people into the gates of the heavenly Jerusalem. They're going to heaven. Um, and you can see how their bodies are almost identically shown. They're all in roughly the same prayerful pose, two men and a, whim and a woman. Uh, there's probably a missing part that would show uh, corpses rising from tombs, perhaps just below this. Um, and then on the other side, in the separate piece, we see uh, a couple of uh, the dead here with a chain around their waist, and that chain is being pulled by a green demon, and they're all being pulled towards a hell mouth. Um, if you look, the entire right side is made up of an enormous gaping mouth. Um, it's as if a large snake has unhinged its jaw. And we actually have two sets of eyes and two noses if you take a look at the top and the bottom on this incredible gaping hell mouth. And there's already one chain figure sort of inside praying for mercy. I want to give you a closer look at the hell side of the Last Judgment uh, because you can see, again, some really nice uh, evidence of the original painted decoration, the polychromy, multicolored decoration here. Um, and that really vivid red that you can see in the incisions in the jacket of the demon here uh, that's probably a, uh, a mercury-based red 
um, a very hazardous pigment, one that uh, really is not produced today, but it, it makes a, a very stable, very bright red color. Um, and then you can see the green in the, the ground here. Um, probably a mixture of an ochre, maybe with a malachite. Um, and then the green also on the figure itself. Um, and also get a, a wonderful feel for that gaping hell mouth uh, with its huge incisors and that figure kind of praying for mercy on the inside. Here's our very last example, um, and this is one that I had a chance to examine in the Nasher Museum at Duke University. And it shows Christ uh, tied to a column and being flogged. Uh, this is part of the tortures that uh, occur prior to the crucifixion. And he's surrounded by four grinning figures who are in the act of flailing him with, uh, with whips. And there's uh, lots and lots of gold leftover visible on this piece. You can see some of the red ground that was used beneath the gold. Uh, oftentimes they would attach the gilding to kind of a, a red tinted wax in order to make it adhere. Um, the point I want to make is that uh, since this alabaster was uh, so abundant in the area around Nottingham and so easy to work, uh, it, it was possible for medieval artists in this area to create sort of a cottage industry of relatively inexpensive altarpieces that could be made and shipped all over the place. And we have many, many examples of these uh, from all over Europe. There are fewer today in, in England, and if you know anything about English history and Henry VIII uh, throwing out the Catholic Church, you'll know that uh, that occurred with the accompaniment of many images being destroyed. Um, and so there would have been widespread destruction of this material in Britain. So we have to assume that at least twice as many of these uh, would have existed in, uh, originally. And that's sort of a, a conservative number. Um, but again, it's, in, it's important to, uh, to recognize that the ease of production here is what sort of was the underpinning of an entire industry for over a century in Northern England.